Hey folks, this is Grease Scotsman. Welcome to the Marrow SDK tutorial series on creating a level in Bone Lab. This guide will cover creating the level geometry, adding colliders so that the player and objects within it play well with the Bone Lab physics system, and getting the level into the game as a mod. This multi part video series has been broken down based on topic. Other steps, like texturing and UVs, lighting, light probes, reflection probes, adding shootable targets, and so on, will be covered in other segments. If you are already familiar with the topic, you can hop directly to the subjects that are useful to you. Creating level geometry from scratch will require 3D modeling software like Blender, or you can use the ProBuilder Unity package to craft a geometry directly in the editor. If you are completely new to level design and creation, this series includes a Blender and ProBuilder primer with a basic overview of the strengths of each option. The primers will also ensure that you are familiar with all of the tools and techniques needed to complete this tutorial series. Blender will be featured in this segment due to the greater fidelity and flexibility that it provides, but the level can also be built with ProBuilder. This tutorial will walk through creating a firing range. Yes, there's already a much cooler one in Vanilla Bone Lab, but a firing range is a clear concept. It's a nearly single room map with easy lighting and simple geometric shapes. As described in the workflow recommendations video, one of the first tips is to import a Ford model or some other human-sized equivalent directly into Blender to be used as a scaling reference. The footage during this introduction was taken from my whiteboxing phase. Whiteboxing is where you simply let your creativity flow and don't worry about making efficient geometry. The goal is to get the level idea in rough, testable form and then use it as a guide for making efficient geometry. In only a few minutes, you can block out the basic design, slap a mesh collider on the geometry, only for testing purposes, we'll do proper collidering soon, and hop into the map to verify that the scale and overall design, born of one's imagination, is working as intended in-game. Now we'll slow things down and provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to create the actual level, using the Rough Cut White Box model as a guide. Import the FBX file of the map linked in the description into Blender and place it at 000. This model will act as your own white box visual guide. Begin by adding a new cube to the scene. You can toggle between object and edit mode by hitting tab. Under the modeling tab, enter edit mode and click the add menu then select Cube. Center the object in the scene. I adjusted the origin point of the cube so that its bottom face was flush to the floor of my white box geometry. If you already have geometry in the scene, this cube will be added as part of the existing geometry. The new object will have all of its faces selected, so right click and choose Separate and then Selection. Rename this new cube appropriately. I named mine ShootingRange.Craybox and the mockup model as shooting range white box. Adjust the grid snap and grid increment settings to make sure that objects will snap to the grid when manipulated. I recommend the grid increment of 0.5 meters. Ensure that you are in face selection mode by pressing three. Select one of the side faces along the Y axis of the cube and pull it so that it matches the outer wall of the white box reference model. Pull the other faces along the x-axis so that they also match the white box's model exterior. Switching to a top-down orthogonal view can be useful to ensure edges are lined up properly. Once the base is set, raise the top face to match the roof of the reference model. Next, select all of the faces of the cube by pressing A, and then click Mesh, then Normals, and then Flip. This will turn the outward faces of the cube inward, creating a room into which the player can spawn. Create another cube bring its bottom face flush with the floor of the larger cube, separate it so that it is its own mesh as before, by right-clicking once all faces are selected and choosing Separate Selection. Name this object ShootingRange.GrayBox.Counter. Using the white box model as a guide, move this cube near where the white box model has its rounded corner walls. Resize the counter along the x-axis in both directions to span the width of the room, and then select the positive y face and pull it one meter along the positive y-axis. At this point, there will be several faces of this counter object that will never be visible to the player and can be deleted. The bottom face and its two side faces along the x-axis. In Blender, with each face selected, press delete and then select face from the menu that appears. Create yet another cube and separate it as before. Name this object shootingrange.graybox.stall. Position this cube so that its bottom face rests on the top edge of the counter and pull its topmost face up until it is two and a half meters tall. So far, 
All steps have only required selecting and dragging faces of cubes to resize them. Well now, select the positive Y face of this doll object and perform an extrude with the E key. Select the bottom edge of this cube that hangs past the counter. Press E in Blender to extrude it down to the floor. As before, delete the faces that the player will never see. Unity should technically call these faces automatically when traversing the level normally, but since the Nimbus gun provides the ability for players to escape the geometry of the map, I am specifically removing faces that would cause Z fighting. In the following footage, multiple stall separating walls will be shown. If you're using Blender, don't worry about creating multiple walls. Perform all of the operations on a single divider that will then be multiplied and offset using Blender's Array modifier. Enter edge mode in Blender by pressing 2. Select the outer topmost edge of the stall object above the counter. Click the bevel tool or press Ctrl B. Pull the handle slightly away and down to create a chamfered edge. When the handle is released, Blender will present a bevel window where details of the bevel operation can be specified. Change the segments to 8 and the width to 0.5. Select the faces of the rounded corner and the faces between it and the counter and separate them into a new mesh. Name these shootingrange.graybox.stall.cap. This will turn the geometry of the stall that stretches from the counter to the back of the firing range into a simple rectangle. Select the stall cap, then while in edge mode, select a horizontal segment of the cap and add a loop cut. Use the mouse wheel to increase the number of cuts to two. Perform the cut, and then adjust the position of each loop. Change the grid scale using the overlays pull down to 0.25. You can select an entire loop cut using Alt-click, drag one of the cuts so that it is 0.25 meters away from its edge. Adjust the position of the other loop cut so that it is also 0.25 meters away, but from the opposite edge. This will create a 0.5 meter wide channel along the stall cap object. Create a similar half meter wide rectangle using Blender loop cuts along the long rectangle of the stall divider that stretches to the back of the room. Switch to the face selection mode and drag the long central face down so that it creates a 0.25 meter groove in the stall geometry. Next, select all the faces along the central channel of the stall cap. Hold left click on the extrude tool to expand the menu and select extrude manifold. Click and drag the handle to push the faces 0.25 meters inward. Align the edge of the top central quad with the edge of the groove just created in the long stall object. Remove the central faces that separate the cap and stall pieces. This will create one continuous groove from the cap piece to the long stall wall. Adding textures and creating UVs will be covered in another segment, so don't worry about them right now. Let's add yet another cube to the map, separate it into its own mesh, and align its bottom edge to the floor of the shooting range. This time set the grid scale to 0.1 meters and then squash down the cube so that it is a mere 0.1 meters tall. Extend the edge along the x-axis so that the object spans the entire width of the stall. This geometry will act as a track or stand that will hold targets that the player will shoot. Select the edges of the top face and adjust them so that the track looks a bit like a speed bump. Adjust the grid size to 0.05 and reduce the height of the track to 0.05 meters. Now extend that track in the x-direction to span the entire room. With just the track selected, click the Modifier tab and select Array. The Array modifier is very useful when you want to duplicate a mesh and space them out in a consistent way. Any changes made to the mesh will be reflected in all of the duplicates. In this case, change the count to 4 and expand the Constant Offset pulldown. Enable the Constant Offset feature, adjust the Distance Y value to 5 meters, and then in the Relative Offset section, change the factor Y to 0.005. This will create evenly spaced tracks 5 meters apart down the firing range course. Next, select both the stall and the stall cap objects and apply the array modifier to them. Set the count to 3, set the relative offset factor x to 1. In the constant offset section, set the distance x to 4 meters. Ensure that the stalls are centered relative to the room along the x-axis. This should create 3 evenly spaced dividers across the room. Another step that will make handling rotations easier is to ensure that mesh objects have their pivot points centered. 
Switch into objects mode using the tab key. Select an object, right click, choose set origin, and then origin to center of mass surface. Other options are available, so you may want to try out each one to see which provides the best pivot point for your needs. But center of mass surface works well in this case. Repeat these steps for all objects for which you want the pivot point to be centered in the mesh. It's finally time to export the level and bring it into Bone Lab. Exporting the FBX requires a few options to be checked in Blender so that some common problems can be avoided. Here are the recommended export settings. Since the model has no animation or armature data, baked animation and armature settings can be disabled. Be sure to enable the Limit to Visible Objects checkbox to avoid importing the scaling model, its rig, the scene light, and the Blender camera. Ensure that the scale is 1, and Apply Scalings is set to FBX All. Most importantly, Blender uses a Z-Up Axis orientation, while Unity uses a Y-Up Axis system. If you do not account for this, the game objects will be physically oriented correctly when brought into the scene, but their transform handles will be rotated and based off of the Blender system. This means that anything that you try to add to the model like child objects to hold your colliders, will have that wonky orientation and will be very difficult to work with. Thankfully, Blender has an experimental feature called Apply Transform that will adjust the transform of objects to follow Unity's access convention. Here's an example of an export without the Apply Transform feature. Notice how Z, or forward, is currently oriented upward for all of the model's child objects in Unity. As you can imagine, sizing and lining up colliders will be extremely difficult in this situation. Here's an export of the map enabling the Apply Transform feature. Notice how all objects correctly follow Unity's orientation convention. I've resized my Unity window layout so that everything fits into the canvas of the video. This is a fresh Unity project with the Miro SDK imported into it using the BoneLab Miro SDK project setup guide video linked below and found on the official Stress Level Zero YouTube channel. Instructions can also be found in the Miro SDK wiki. To import the level into Unity, Simply drag the FBX file into the project window. To ensure the model's origin resides at 000, you can drag the FBX from the project window into the hierarchy, or drag it into the scene and manually reset the transform's position. Importing and applying textures will be covered in the Texturing, UVs, and Materials segment. The final step of this segment will be to add colliders. Mesh colliders should be avoided whenever possible. They are useful when you have very organic surfaces where primitive colliders can't match the topology of the mesh. Mesh colliders are expensive compared to their primitive collider counterparts, and, most importantly, they are paper thin. Bone Lab is a game all about physics and collisions, and if the player or an object hits the wall or floor at high speeds or low frame rate, if the colliders are not thick enough, the player or object may get stuck within or pass straight through the thin collider. Thin colliders are anything less than 10 centimeters in width. Any ground, floor, or walls should be at least 10 centimeters to 50 centimeters thick. If the mechanics of the map will propel an object or the player at high speeds, where they might impact at that high velocity, aim for those colliders to be one meter thick. It is also a great idea to overlap colliders that meet at a corner to avoid objects literally slipping through the cracks. The collidering task may seem tedious, but it is the best way to ensure that the player and dynamic objects play nicely with the Bone Lab physics system. If you truly want to avoid doing this by hand, there are paid tools on the Unity Asset Store that will simplify the process. The stall cap with a rounded corner is pretty much the only object with a mesh collider in this scene. To turn a level into a mod, it must be added to a level crate and packed into a pallet. To do this, ensure that the Asset Warehouse window is visible. If not, select Stress Level 0, Void Tools, and then Asset Warehouse from the menu. If the Unity project does not yet have a palette, add one using the Create Palette button. As a reminder, due to the way that Unity addressables work, you only want one palette per Unity project to avoid problems. Add a level crate to the project by selecting the palette in the Asset Warehouse and clicking Add Crate in the Inspector. Fill out the Add Crate wizard, changing the crate type to Level Crate, setting the asset reference to the scene file of the level, and filling out the title field. Once the level crate has been made, click the Pack Palette button at the top of the Asset Warehouse window. You can switch the target platform for the mod between PC and Quest 2 using the pull-down menu prior to clicking Pack Palette if needed. Copy the mod folder that is output by the Pack process into your BoneLab Mods folder. Start BoneLab 
and use the menu to enter the map. Congratulations, you've successfully created the geometry and colliders for your first level in Bone Lab. Creating UVs, textures, and materials, setting non-dynamic objects to static so that they benefit from the occlusion and bake lighting systems, setting up light and reflection probes, creating physics-based targets that react to gunfire, and so on, will all be covered in other video segments, so stay tuned. Until then, see you in the void.